So I'm writing a book called How to Fix the Future. I fear the future's broken at the moment. Um, and it's broken because we've created all this amazing technology, fantastic technology, which is transforming the world, transforming how we think about ourselves, how we interact, how we work, how we make money. Um, but we've forgotten one thing, and that one thing is ourselves. So the future has a hole in it. Why, why are humans struggling to keep up with the future? Why are humans at the moment not really in the future? Um, I think it's because humans aren't computer chips. Um, you'll remember Gordon Moore, the, one of the co-founders of Intel, came out with his famous Moore's Law, which is still true, which is every 18 months, the processing power of chips will double. So over the last 40 years since Moore made his famous law, computers have become ever more powerful, ever more intelligent, ever more creative and destructive. Uh, now, I don't have it in my pocket, but my iPhone over there um, has the processing power of a supercomputer of the 1960s that would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars. The problem, though, is that Moore's Law doesn't work with human beings. We're not chips. We haven't changed. We're still as, we're still as complicated, as flawed, as profound, as beautiful, as ugly, as all the other things we can say about human beings, as we were in 1970, as we were in 1960, as we were in 1980. And we're struggling to keep up with all this remarkable change. And most importantly now, Moore's Law is creating both hardware and software that will re replicate us as human beings, and particularly replicate what we do in terms of our jobs. Uh, replace us in some ways. And that's why the future is broken, because we haven't, in the midst of all this profound, remarkable, revolutionary, disrupt disruptive and destructive technological change, we haven't figured out our own place in the future. Now, that doesn't mean, I'm not a Luddite, I'm not saying we should go out and smash the machines, I'm not saying that we should end Moore's law and say it's illegal to keep on manufacturing computer chips that are doubly as powerful as they were the year before. But this is a, an enormous issue for human beings. It's one of the great challenges, some people think the greatest challenge in our history as a species. Am I optimistic or pessimistic about humans' future as it relates to technology? Um, is that a trick question in the sense that I'm a human being? So it's hard for me to, it's hard for me not to be optimistic. It's hard for me not to be optimistic because if I wasn't, I would just give up. It would mean that our species would be finished. It would mean that we would probably in the end give ourselves up to some sort of artificially intelligent overlord. So I have to be optimistic. But I'm not utopian. I don't think that this will happen with a flick of a switch. The problem is, is we've become so, uh, we've, we've taken technological solutions so much for granted that we're not able to come up with a solution that technology isn't the solution. It doesn't mean technology is the problem. It doesn't mean we smash the machines. But it does mean that if humans are going to have a place, it can't be a human algorithm, a human app, a human thing on our, shelf, on our cell phones or implanted in our brains. Um, so we need to think in non-technological terms too if we're to come up with a solution. And our culture, our civilization, has become so skewed to the technological that we're forgetting other things too. We need to remember those. And that's my role and role, the, the role of thinkers, writers, speakers like myself. We're trying to shake people and say, hold on a minute, this, this is going wrong. There's a hole in the future. And if we're going to fill it, it can't be solved by Google or Apple or another app. How do we fix the future? I'm not going to tell you everything because my book's coming out next year. Um, but I do think we need to concentrate on the things that computers can never do. Uh, computers don't have goals. Computers 
don't have morality. That is the thing, goals and morality, which distinguishes us, I think, from computers. And that's what we need to remind ourselves of. And this has been known right from the beginning. Um, Ada Lovelace, who was the uh, a partner, a uh, business partner, intellectual partner of Charles Babbage. Lovelace and Babbage were the, the two people who essentially invented the computer in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, they were both eccentric inventors of one kind or other. Ada Lovelace was actually the daughter of Lord Byron. She was a self-taught mathematician, complete genius. And she came up with the idea of software. She was the first person who even imagined the idea of there being such a thing as software. Babbage came up with the idea of the mechanical computer. He was more of a hardware guy. She was his, his, his software partner. Um, but she famously said about software, it can't originate things. And that is as true today as it was in the middle of the 19th century, you know, almost 200 years later. Code can't originate things. Code can't be moral. Co code can't replicate the the qualities of, of, of humanness related to having goals, having morality, and being able to originate things. And that's why, probably in the long term, computers will never become our rulers. But it also means that we need to seize back our realm as human beings and remind ourselves of what we can do. Because in the future, computer software will replace us in many ways. And in some ways, it's great. We won't have to take the garbage out probably anymore. We won't have to drive. We won't have to work in factories. Um, but that does leave a very profound question. What are we going to do with ourselves? Are we going to sit on Facebook all day or on Twitter? Are we going to take selfies? Obviously, that's not realistic. But we need to reinvent ourselves in the network digital world. The issue of um, a basic minimum income, basic minimum wage is becoming more and more relevant and popular. There was, um, there was um, um, a vote, a plebiscite about it recently in Switzerland. Uh, the Finns, the Finnish government, are pioneering some ideas about it next year. And it's becoming, interestingly enough, a subject that unites many different people from libertarian Silicon Valley venture capitalists who think it's a good thing because they understand the implications, to hippies in Sweden and Switzerland, to old-fashioned socialists elsewhere in the world. I think it's an important issue. I'm not sure how practical it is in the very near term, but certainly this idea that we should be able to be supported as human beings to be able to afford to feed ourselves and our children and, and afford clothing for ourselves. Uh, this is going to become more and more central as the idea of full employment, which was certainly true in the late industrial age, is no longer relevant in the digital age. Now, some people think that there'll be jobs for everyone in the digital age. Is maybe we'll all be able to be entrepreneurs or app developers or masseurs or cooks or gardeners or some others of the professions which or, or work that can't be replicated by, by computers. But I'm rather doubtful of that. And in that case, then the idea of a guaranteed minimum wage becomes politically important. I think one of the most important things to bear in mind about this new world that we are descending quite quickly into is that the role of government becomes more important. The first wave, or the first two waves of digital innovation, the sort of the hardware phase in, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and then the internet revolution of the 90s and the, last, the first 15 years of the 21st century, didn't require government. And government, and that's sort of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and thinkers tended to be quite libertarian and always see government as the problem. But as this technology increasingly transforms every sector of the economy, from you know, ed education to healthcare, uh, to spheres where the government has traditionally played a role, government will become increasingly important. Steve Case, the founder of AOL and 
perhaps the, the first really important internet entrepreneur, has just written a book called The Third Wave in which he argues this. So what we'll see is a shift away from that kind of libertarian Silicon Valley ethic to one in which government plays a more important role. We saw the same in the Industrial Revolution. In some ways, hist history is just really repeating itself. So how, what will this mean to self-organization in society, and will the future be dominated by large or small companies? I certainly think the idea of a, a large industrial company like Ford uh, is something that won't exist in the future because there won't be need for such large companies. We may have a, a kind of a, a platform-like company uh, sort of a, a, a post um, a post uh, Uber where um, people's work where people will be able to work on platforms together uh, but the notion of large bureaucratic companies I don't think will exist in the future one reason for that of course is because new technologies like blockchain will mean that you'll no longer need large bureaucracies to maintain order to keep records Records will be kept by technology.